Hello, and welcome to Lore Watch, a roundtable freeform discussion about lore and the games of Blizzard Entertainment. I'm your host, Joe Perez, one of several lore focused folks from Blizzard Watch, and I've got my marvelous co host with me today, Matt Rossi. How are you doing today, Matt? Uh, I was bitten by a radioactive spider on my way in, so hopefully, you know, it, pulling for it. If you get to be Spider Man before me, I'm going to have some very choice words. <laughs> well, I was reading Spider Man before you were born. <laughs> I had this guy cast Spider-Man figure when I was like eight, <laughs> like the coolest freaking toy. Um, just man. <laughs> but we're not here to talk about Spider-Man, folks. Today we're going to be doing part two of our Diablo class lore extravaganza. I have no clue what we're calling it. Uh, I leave that all up to, to Dano on the website. He's the one that's more clever with names than I am. Uh, but today we're going to be talking uh, more about those classes. In particular, we were talking about uh, Paladins and Crusaders, which is roughly about where we left off last one. Uh, and so I guess I'll, I'll kind of kick it over to Matt to sort of start things off well in order to talk about paladins and crusaders you kind of have to talk about the zakarum and in order to talk about the zakarum you have to talk about akarat uh, akarat was a hermit basically kind of a guy who lived in the he basically was very humble he just lived out in the wilderness he he was an ascetic i think is the best word for it and one day he was he was basically doing his whole meditation thing and he had a visitation at least as far as he was concerned uh, he saw a being of pure light, and he believed that this being was an angel. He named it the angel Yerius, which means son of light in, in the uh, original language of, of uh, I want to say Chaldean, but that's not the name of the nation. Was Yansai? No, 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 no. This is, uh, I can't remember the name of the nation, even though I know that Chaldean is in it. Ah, I hate when my brain does this. <laughs> Kedjistan. Uh, Kedjistan, yeah. Okay, so yeah, um. He he lived in uh, Kajistan, and he, in the original language of Kajistan, Yeras means son of light. He saw this being, and he believed that through the visitation of this being, he learned that within every person exists this powerful light. Uh, if you devote yourself to this inner light, uh, you can achieve wonders. You, you can touch the, the true nature of divinity in the cosmos. This was the origin of the Zakarum. Zakarum itself basically means inner light. Um, now, some people, specifically Decker Kane, Decker Kane believed that what Z what uh, Akarat saw was a relic of the life of Odyssean, you know, Quadroma, because he believed that Odyssean, um, Old Diomed, sorry, not Quadroma, that's a Star Wars character, jeez. Um, <laughs> he, he believed that Odyssean sacrifice, the, the, giving up his own existence to seal the world stone and prevent the sin war from having ever happened and thus saving sanctuary from the angels and the demons. Uh, he believed that that act reverberated throughout creation, even though it no longer existed, it had existed. And in the, the fact of its existence created the paradox that created the vision well, throughout time and space all these mystics saw it. yeah i was just gonna say because it wasn't it wasn't just akarat that had like similar visions there were oh, a no, series of mystics, mystics yeah yeah other mystics reported to have seen something similar he believed that's what uh akarat saw and in so doing he kind of touched upon the whole nature of the nephilim that they do in fact contain great power all people do contain it because that's the nature of of humanity in the, the diablo universe it, everyone does contain great light and also great darkness. Um, but he he basically started this teaching about this inner light, but he didn't intend a religion. Uh, when he, he basically wandered around Karast t t telling people what he'd seen and telling them you should, you know, listen to the inner light and be, you know, be a good person. You, you, this is what you should do. You should live good lives and be good people and touch upon your inner light. And, People followed him. He gained disciples, but he wasn't trying to gain disciples. He was just trying to spread word of the thing he saw. So after a while, and no one knows exactly when, but Akarat was like, okay, uh, you guys are getting kind of kind of too into me, and he basically vanished. Yeah, into the he, uh, the jungles of Kejusan, right? Like yeah, He just kind of like disappeared off into the wilds. Yeah, he just left. He was like, okay, I've told you people what you're supposed to do. Uh, now go do it. You don't need me for this. Uh, I'm not. I have no special wisdom to impart to you on to how you should live your life. 
I just know what I saw. So I've, I've told you, and now I'm gone. And so he outed. But while that, you know, that was nice for him, the people of, of Karast, which was the city that he first taught it in, basically built up an organization around it. They, they built up a faith, and they called themselves the Zakarum after the Zakara, which was the, eternal, the inner light that he had told them about. Didn't that actually not really become a thing though until what was it? Uh, there was an emperor that codified it, right? Like it was there. It wasn't actually like a church until I don't even remember what year it was, but I, I think the 11th century of the of the setting. The 11th century is when the Haradrim first interacted with them. Now that was that was that's not there was no emperor who had actually told them to be anything yet. But in the 11th century, that's when the Haradrim were. Uh, running around f- hunting down the three prime evils. That was when they the dark exile happened. The three great evils, my apologies. Um, when the three great evils got themselves exiled to, to Sanctuary and the Haradrim began stalking them, the church of Zakarum had gained enough prominence in Kedjistan that they started spreading the word. Uh, they started actually going around teaching people. And this is when... When they created these missionaries, this is when the very first paladins came to be, because they they were like, we're gonna go, te- we're gonna teach everybody in all of Sanctuary about the Holy Light, and they're gonna join the church, and it's gonna be great. And they sent missionaries in various directions, and they got murdered. Like there were bandits and nations that didn't want to hear it, and you know, don't tr- don't try going up to like. Um, the, what, what is now the the dreadlands uh, at the time it was just the northern the northern steppes or Soros you know Sos Glen. don't go up there and try and tell them you've got a new religion because they don't want to hear it and as a result they created the paladins to protect their missionaries that's the original reason for them to to have created paladins because it was they wanted to convert various peoples of other nations to their faith and the priests of Zacharum weren't cutting it they would go up with, they would go, like, we'll, we'll use one example. They would go to the jungles to the south and they'd be like, hey, we've got this holy word for you. And then they would get murdered because the people there already worshipped their own spirits and had no interest in it. So this is where Zacharim starts getting darker because the, the paladins converted people by sword. They weren't converting them. It was very much like old world conquest style, right? Yeah, like it, it was... It was- Roll up, my armor is better than your armor, my weapons are better than your armors, you're going to worship my god now. It happened in the 12th century. Um, so that was about 100 years after the Dark Exile. What, what basically happened was uh, Tal Rasha, who was the head of the Haradrim at the time, had, had connections to the, to the Zakarum. He, he knew them. He, he liked their teachings. He, he believed that they were, the, they were on the right track. When they started hunting down the three prime, the three great evils. Uh, they captured Mephisto, and they were like, "What do we do with him? We we got we still got to catch the other two, and well, you can't just wander around carrying this soul stone. It's like a it's like a screaming beacon to every demon in the vicinity. Like we'll never sneak up on them." And he was like, "I know these monks, and they're they're a small and humble order. They're not particularly widespread, uh, but they have a nice temple that they you know in in Karast." And I'm pretty sure these guys aren't going to get corrupted. So why don't we we leave the crystal with them? And so they did. And this was outside of just outside of Karast, um, right next to it, basically. The the order had a, a temple called Travancal that they built up. And it, this Travancal became the heart of the Zacharum. And it became the heart of not one, but two paladin orders. Uh, protectors of the world in the hand of Zacharum, right? Protectors of the word. Word, and- yep. Chase of the word and the hand of Zacharum, yeah. And <clears throat> the the problem was is that the paladins who were living in in Travancall, basically they were they were being used more and more as the military arm of the church, and the church militant became the church. Like the the, the church of Zacharum became a militant order, and the the hand of Zacharum were very much this kind of well, holy war. They were. They would isn't, certainly. They certainly fought demons. Absolutely, they fought demons. Well, isn't it, isn't it sort of like the logical evolution too? Didn't the church at one point have like a set of inquisitors that would like basically yeah, so go out and murder that, folks that they saw thought were corrupted? Well, the, the Zacharum Inquisition came up because there were demons 
throughout the land. Like they were, they were having trouble with demons. What they call the time of troubles was happening. Mm -hmm. And the, the Zagreb Inquisition didn't actually have inquisitors per se. It was more like some members of the hand of Zagreb would show up in a village. And if they saw anything that even remotely reminded them of demons, they would attack them. Well, they called them and, what zealots, right? Uh, yeah, but that's not quite the same thing. Uh, but it's good enough for government work. Um, but <laughs> here's the problem we had was basically there was a, I don't know how to explain this. There was a rebellion within the church at this time. Like the people within the priests of the soccer room were like, we're kind of losing the thread here, guys. Like this isn't, this isn't what we were supposed to be doing. That the inner light isn't meant to be used like a hammer. I mean, we're just, we're going to places and we're not teaching them about the light they have inside themselves. I mean, the soccer room was supposed to be compatible with anything. Like it wasn't like supposed to be an organized church in the first place. Akarat never intended it to be. And around this time, if I don't know if you know that the, you probably do know this, uh, Rakis was a, a very powerful figure inside Kajistan. Mm -hmm. And he was so powerful that the then emperor basically came up with a way to get rid of him, which was to send him west to spread Zakarum to you know the, the the barbarians as they considered them the barbarians of the western lands who were not the same as the children of Bulkathos who were up the north and the northern steppes, but they considered the people of the western kingdoms to be barbaric, and they were going to conquer them for their own good. But one of the clerics, this is the cleric Akan. He was like, this is not right. We have completely lost the, the thread here. The inner light is supposed to be everyone's inheritance, whether they're a barbarian living in the north or a, a, a swamp dweller to the west, or to the east, or someone up in, in Scots Glen. That's, it doesn't matter. Who they believe in doesn't matter. It's not, we're not supposed to be looking to higher powers and outside forces. It's supposed to be the inner light. It's inside you. You're supposed to reach out to that. What are we doing? What's happened to us? And he wasn't, he was like middly placed. He wasn't like a, like at this point, Mephisto had started to corrupt pretty much everybody who was well placed in the faith. And this is about, I want to say two to 300 years or so ago. Uh, I don't remember exactly off the top of my head, but he, he started looking around inside the church and he's trying, he was like, okay, I don't know who to trust here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an order of seekers who will go out into the world. And he wanted to look for Akarat. That was the thing. He was like, maybe we can find some trace of what happened to Akarat. Maybe that's where we can figure out what's going wrong with the church. And so he didn't want to recruit paladins. He wanted warriors who believed, but they wanted them to believe in the inner light. You know, he didn't want people who believed in the church of Zacharum itself he wanted the people who believed in the thing that Zacharum was supposed to be about. Not, you know, it was more important that they believed in that than in, that they believed in the church itself at this point. But this time, the church with its, you know, its bishops and its its hierarchy. I can't remember the name of the head of the church. I'm going to have to go look that up. He's got a very interesting title. Um, the Quihagen. Yeah. I was um, literally just they, grabbing it. <laughs> yeah. They, they don't, it wasn't that kind of thing they were looking for. He was looking for people who less less faith in the the hierarchy and so forth, and so when he found them, when he got enough of them, he's like, "Okay, we're gonna. I want you to leave. I want you to leave Travancall. I don't want you to tell anyone where you're going. Just go out into the jungle and look for answers. We have to figure out what's wrong with the church." And so, ironically, he took a few hundred of like the church's best followers, the ones who were most incorruptible. And sent them off on a wild goose chase, basically, while Mephisto was right underneath Travancall corrupting it. And so, yeah, um, they left. They were gone, and they were they were basically the Crusaders of of Diablo. They were that the origin of the Crusader Order about two to three hundred years ago. As as they went off in the world, like every one of them that he recruited w was tasked with finding a, like an apprentice somebody that would follow in their footsteps. When one of them died, their apprentice would pick up the armor and weapons, swear the oath, and take their name. Yep. So every crusader is named after one of the original crusaders who left 200 something years ago. 
and they've been searching this whole time for the secret to what corrupted the Church of Zacharum. Obviously, while that was going on, the Paladin Orders were still spreading. One of the Paladin Orders went west with Rakis and helped conquer what is now Westmarch and Kenduras. Uh, those two nations were, were settled by people from Kedjistan who were sent out basically because they were troublesome. Aren't those now the ones that went that way? Aren't those now the Knights of Westmarch? Kind some of them are, yeah. Yeah. Some of them are. Uh, the ones that were like most loyal to Rakis directly. Uh, but obviously some of the corrupted uh, bishops went west with them. Um, Archbishop Lazarus is is a, one of the, you know, he's in that tradition. Um, he went west with them. There was, at this point, it, it's, it's basically to explain what happened to the paladins, why there aren't any paladins in Diablo 3. Basically, one of the two paladin orders, the protectors of the word were essentially, they were defunct, for lack of a better word. It wasn't that they were gone exactly um, they, they hard- weren't a, they weren't a cohesive like organization anymore like others well, it's like, look it out like some of them became like the knights of west march mm-hmm. and other things like that they they were basically they existed you know they were part of the the protecting of of missionaries and so forth but most of them went with rockies when he went mar- when he went west and meanwhile the the uh the, the hand of zacharum were the became the paladin order in the east they became the the, the power there so the the west march ones the the knights of the uh i mean the protectors of the word did stuff like they fought the monks of ivgarod you know and they fought the barbarians and they didn't really they 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 couldn't really conquer those two groups because they each of them had their own faith that wasn't amenable to the zakarum like the barbarians were like, yeah, we know there's an inner light in all of us. It the ancestors have told us about that. You can go away now. And when they didn't go away and tried to push into the north, they got their butts handed to them to the point where they had to build a fortress just to keep the barbarians from coming south. Because the barbarians were now now the barbarians were mad. They had told you to stay out. You didn't listen. So now they're gonna now Rakis found himself in an eternal border conflict. So he went to Ivgarod instead and tried to conquer that. And the exact same thing happened, except this time with a, a lot more flipping and backflipping and kicking. Mm-hmm. But basically, the, the monks of Ivgrad were like, you're going to tell us about the inner light? <laughs> yeah, okay, buddy. We've been, ha- you know, what do you think, a- you know, a- Akarat was one of us. He lived out in the mountains, and he studied things. It, it, it's not, this, this, you are not teaching us anything we need to know. And they're, they're actually pretty close to, like, Scotland as well. If Garad's up in the north, it's not too far away from it. Um, I think it's actually pretty close to the Dreadlands as well. Like the Dreadlands, it's are to the west of it, so it's just across the water from some Scotland. Yeah, it's not too far but, away. But either way, it's just so those were the places where they failed. But they really had a lot of success um, in what's now Westmarch and Candorus and those areas. They they. A lot of times they didn't even have to conquer anybody. They just showed up and said, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna bring civilization and order to this place." And they're like, "Well, yeah, okay, we're, we're farmers, so that's fine. We'll just we'll bring our grain in here." So that they did pretty well in. But as a result, yeah, that that order basically became part of West March, and to a lesser degree, Candorus. They became part and parcel of of the the way that those states existed. And over time, since the uh, the hand of of Zacharum were like going gangbusters in the east. There wasn't really a place for them. the The protectors of the word didn't really have. There wasn't any. It, they kind of went back to that idea that Akarat originally had. That you would just you just follow your inner light and you just do what you could to be a good person, and that was what you were supposed to do. And so they didn't really have a place in. They didn't have a place in the city in the states of West March or Kedjistan anymore. And that's why other orders replaced them. But they, they still kind of like every so often you'd meet somebody that like was a, you know, who had learned how to be a paladin from his, his mother who learned how to be a paladin from her father who learned how to be a paladin from some protector of the word out there. Like that they still, every so often one would pop up, but if you really wanted a paladin order, that was the hand of Zacharum and it was corrupt from top to bottom. I mean, because if you were Mephisto, are you going to let these people go without installing your followers in there? Absolutely not. That would, that would be a disaster for you. The most incorruptible members, 
the most incorruptible knights who could have been great paladins had all left to go look for what was going on. The ones that hadn't left to do that had gone west with Rockies. So the guys who had left were the ones who were really big on, you know, storming into a small village in a swamp somewhere and burning everybody who didn't follow Zakarum. And those guys make really good converts to Mephisto. He's all about hate. So in the end, that's kind of why you don't see paladins anymore, at least in Diablo 3. They still exist, but they're relatively rare. Um, whereas the Crusaders, the Crusaders spent 200 years looking around for what, you know, what was corrupting the, the Church of Zakarum. And then one day, Kedjistan blew up and, you know, Kurast was destroyed and Travancal was utterly destroyed. Kurast still exists. It was just kind of abandoned, whereas Travancal, Travancal got messed up. And it turns out that there's this, like, fiend living there the whole time and corrupting the church and, like, hundreds of people in the church hierarchy. And so, essentially, that's where the Church of Zakarum died. Like, people still kind of believe in it, but it's there's no... The, the Quahagan's gone. There's no orderly like leadership. When when Emperor Hakan fled to the to Chaldeum, he didn't bring any with him. He didn't have any. You'll notice he doesn't have any spiritual advisors, and so you basically end up with paladins kind of got wiped out. Like the ones that weren't corrupt, kind of like a lot of them turned away. They're like, oh, you know, I can't believe in this. Uh, the Knights of Westmarch, as you pointed out, still exist, but they were kind of distanced. Anyway, because they were they were a West March organization, they weren't part of Kedjistan, and so they were kind of like they they accepted the spiritual authority of the Quahagan, but they weren't particularly part of that church, and so they've sort of still continue to exist. They just kind of like okay, whatever, we're just going to be the Knights of West March. Then. But it's definitely a it's a destabilized situation, and and this is again, this is again is of course this is up to Diablo three. We don't know what's going on by Diablo four time. Uh, Having a, keep in mind that the people of Zakarum believe that an angel came to teach them the word. They believe that the angel Yarius came and taught them about the inner light. Having another angel declare war on humanity is is probably it's faith shaking beyond it, beyond just having an, an angel declare war on humanity and successfully wipe out a large section of it at that point too. Like and then take into effect the uh corruption of the Church of Zacharum, right? And everything else that happened in between. It it that's enough to shake, I think, any organization's faith in itself. And at this point there really isn't an organization. There isn't there's nobody in charge of the Church of Zacharum. There are like priests and, and so forth, but there's no it's kind of like imagine if you blew up Rome in AD eight ninety and just wiped out the Pope. And the sure, you know, you'd have the Eastern Orthodox religion, but it's way the heck to the east and nobody really knows much about it. There's no there's no centralizing authority anymore. Well that hasn't been since what? Since uh what the since uh Mephisto was killed? Yeah, Diablo two. Yep. The Quahagan gets destroyed, the, the the church is revealed to have like a demon in in its heart. They tried they're trying to root that out and everyone's like, Well your faith has been proved completely, you know, false and then this happens and it's like okay not only is the faith false faith false everything we believed it turns out that they hate us like keep in mind that like if you look at the if you look at even the the monastery in um old tristram there's angels in the in the stained glass you know they they, they thought the angels liked them they thought the angels supported them but the angels don't care at all about humanity in in diablo the the angels so there's there's a lot of any any paladin you meet now is going to be either an old holdover from from Diablo want to uh, like from that period of time, or somebody who is somehow taught, been, is effectively self taught. Um, there's very few members of either of the orders still around, which is kind of why instead of seeing paladins in Diablo three, Crusaders sort of came back into yeah. the, the the limelight, right? Well, because Crusaders had been out looking, for, you know, 200 years or so, again, searching for the truth. Then it get it turns out they're like, you know, oh, it turns out this happened. And they're like, well, okay, what, what does that mean for our search? And that's when the falling star comes down and a Crusader hears about it and goes to investigate and leads to the events of Diablo 3. So it's also clear that whatever else happened, the Crusaders are not particularly interested in teaching anybody anything. They're seekers of truth they're not imparters of truth mm -hmm. they don't in fact think they know the truth that's the whole point of being a crusader you're looking for it so 
sure, Crusader will pick up an apprentice and teach the apprentice, and the event apprentice will eventually be intended to replace them. Uh, and some of them, some of them have, didn't get to. There's there's less Crusaders now than there was when they started out. Some of them have not been replaced. Uh, the ones that have have continued. So you've got this group of a couple, like maybe less than 200 people, who aren't proselytizing. They believe in the in the inner light. They believe in Zakarum. They believe in Akarat, but they're not teaching it. And that's the difference. The paladins, you know, may, to them, service had a lot to do with spreading the words. Keep in mind, the original paladins were created to protect missionaries who were going to go out and spread the word of Zakarum. That was their fundamental, original guiding purpose. They were there to help spread the word. the The Crusaders are not here to do that. And that's the fundamental difference between paladins and crusaders. Crusaders always have that edge of, I mean, this way of life is the way of life that we want to teach you. And crusaders are, yeah, you should believe in the inner light, but that's got nothing to do with me. I'm looking for something. Um, until I find and, it, I got nothing for you. It, it's also, it also, is, it, it, interestingly enough, I think really plays into the uh, manifestation of powers that, that are the difference between the classes too, right? Like when you have the old paladin orders uh, and you go back to Diablo 2 uh, there's a lot of like buffing up defenses buffing up uh, like oh my weapon can hit a little bit stronger um, it's not quite the same as the crusader which there is very much about the invocation of what they call wrath yes and it's because they knew there's corruption at the heart of the order there's corruption and it needs to be rooted out we have to find out where it comes from and destroy it that's what they're all about. Paladins are about, in a way, paladins are about bringing the inner light to the lives of, of regular people. They're like, I am an example. Here I am. I am yeah. an exemplar of the faith. The crusader is not here to be an exemplar of anything. They're not here to impress you. They are here to wipe things out. Yeah, and now if, if you happen to get impressed by the fact that they've left a wake of bodies of demonic forms in their wake as they blow through your town, that's a whole other thing. That wasn't their intention. They were there to clear out what they needed to clear out on their way to you know the next truth or on the way to seek whatever the next piece of justice that they're looking to, to, to grab is. And if you happen to like it and maybe you want to become an apprentice, cool. If not, wasn't there wasn't their intentional goal to begin with. And so, uh, in a way, um, oh, boy, heck, I forgot his name. The I'll have to go look him up again. But the guy that founded the order, uh, Akan, mm -hmm. he kind of gave them an impossible task. And part of the reason for that is that he was not highly placed in the church. He was a mid-level cleric. He had enough authority to do this, <coughs> but he, he did so. Keep in mind, the people he selected weren't, were themselves not highly placed. He, went, he was looking for raw recruits who were the right material to mold into what he wanted. But he definitely didn't He didn't go to people. That, like Being a paladin at that time was a prestige thing. If you were a paladin, you were considered to be the best of the best of the Church of Zachary. Uh And the, both of the orders competed with each other. And that was something that he wanted to avoid. Because that was what was leading to Rockus's leaving in the first place, was the rivalry between factions of the Church. And he saw that as part of the corruption. So he went out and found people who were like extremely, they were like talented warriors, extremely zealous in an, in an internal way. And he basically directed them away from the paladins. He's like, I have a special mission for you. And he very definitely didn't want them to think of themselves as paladins because the paladins were proud. The paladins were very, you know, showy. Like you mentioned the Diablo 2 stuff, the powers of the Paladin were, were about being visually impressive while also being a bastion of defense. Like you were there to defend missionaries. You were there to defend the faith. The, the Crusaders were not there to defend the faith. In their minds, the faith had already failed in terms of the organization. The Church of Zakarum had failed. That's why they were going out into the world. They were leaving Travancal, the temple city, and exploring the world. They were heading off into the jungle in the in the um, steps of Akarat to find what he had been seeking 
And when they didn't find it there, they spread out across the world and began looking everywhere they could go. And interestingly enough, unlike the Paladins, because of how the Crusaders were you know, sort of steered away from becoming Paladins, steered away from that competition, and for lack of a better term, accepted that the faith had failed before technically the faith had fully failed, uh, they remain uncorrupted. Like, as a, a type of character, I guess the best way to put it, the ideals of the Crusader have never been uh, uprooted. They've never been eroded because they didn't fall to the same thing that some of the pal other paladin orders or, in fact, the Church of Zacharum did as a whole. They they have their faith. They have their faith in themselves, uh, in whatever you can call it, zealotry or whatever, but their undying confidence in their undying cause. And like you pointed out before, they take, even if they were to take on an apprentice, when the crusader dies, the apprentice takes up the mantle and continues the cycle. There isn't, uh, this competing effort with other crusaders. There isn't this, uh, competing, uh, showiness, uh, to be visually no impressive. Hierarchy. Yeah, there's no hierarchy there. Yeah, exactly. It's just you have you master and apprentice. That's it. Yeah, and and you accept that you your your faith is your faith is in yourself and the inner light, as in the original teaching, and you go forth and find answers to whatever the corruption and and bringing light to those dark places through basically crushing force against the forces of the prime evils, right? Or corruption in general, however you want to phrase it. But I think it's interesting yeah. that they, they remain uncorrupted because they were, they were sent away. Yeah, exactly. And, and interestingly enough, um, while we're talking about this, there's a third group I'm going to bring up and that group's the Templars. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the, the Templar order in, in sanctuary is very different than anything you might know from other historical settings or, video games the way it works is we mentioned before there were two orders of paladins there were the the uh we just talked about them the brotherhood of the word and the, the protectors hand. of the word the hand the, of the word and the hand of zacharum yep. the hand of zacharum were the ones that were more thoroughly infested with with mephisto's followers um because they were the ones who stayed more they stayed in power inside kegistan while the while the uh Protectors of the Word went forth into Rakis as part of the Sons of Rakis. Uh, and, and they ended up in West March, and they ended up in, in, in uh, Kanduras. The Hand of Zacharum, of course, any time that a, a church would get founded, the Hand of Zacharum would send somebody. So there were members of the Hand of Zacharum all over the place. They were, there were members of the Hand of Zacharum in West March. And when the corruption that Mephisto had spread throughout the uh, Hand of, of, throughout the entire Zacharum faith, became clear and when the hand of Zacharum showed itself to be full of corrupt figures they weren't you know the paladins that they were supposed to be this was like a this was like a knife in the hearts of the, the ones that were in the hand of Zacharum that were still loyal that were still you know still had their faith hadn't betrayed it and this caused essentially the hand of Zacharum in the west collapsed uh, the ones in the east also collapsed, but they collapsed after the you know various heroes came to stop the Dark Wanderer. The ones in West March who weren't corrupted, that after the corruption was effectively burned out, the ones that were left decided, we're, this is too ruined. We can't call ourselves the Hand of Zacharum anymore. We can't be the Hand of Zacharum. But we need to do something. We, and we need to protect... The, the, we still believe in the inner light. We still believe in faith. But there's corruption in the hearts of, of anyone. If, if the hand of Zacharum can be corrupted, anybody can be corrupted. We need a new way to be cleansed. We need a way to be, to be purified of our sins and our corruptions. And the members of the hand of Zacharum that, that founded the Templar order effectively came up with a way they would torture themselves until they broke. They, they and, essentially became flatulence in, the, in that regard. Way far further than that. But yeah, we, they would torture their their new co incoming members until they broke. They 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 were basically uh, under the Grand Master, um, the Grand Maester. My apologies. Uh, they were kidnapping people, just citizens, random people, and they would literally torture them until they broke and forgot their lives. Like they would just put them into like shock and then re-educate them as members of the order. And as a result, every single Templar you met had gone through this the re-education through scourging and whips and all that, they had essentially forgotten who they were. They, their lives were gone. 
this was the secret of the Templar Order that they they'd been they'd been trained they they'd gained the power of the Holy Light, but only after they were essentially broken, utterly broken. So they they didn't even know who they were. They didn't even remember their past lives. They didn't know who their families were. Anything. And so the order was everything to them. And the hope was that they couldn't be corrupted because they didn't have anything to be corrupted by. Yeah. And they basically they were severing all, uh, almost all ties to humanity too. Wasn't there also like, it was rumored that this is where the idea that they would take vows against like romance and intercourse and marriage and all that other good stuff. Uh, it was never, although never confirmed was also part of that because then if they didn't have sort of that worldly attachment, it couldn't be corrupted. It was basically the idea. I don't know if they actually took vows against it so much as they just were never, none of that was ever explained to them that you, they were never told anything about, you know, a normal life, finding a woman, anything like that. They, they didn't have that. They, they were just, your life is this now. And they were told they were criminals in their previous lives, which wasn't true. No, they were just, but that's the and, exaggeration and, and, of sin, right? Any random, no, but I mean, any random person off the street could get grabbed, but then they were told you were a criminal who was sentenced to this. Yeah, you, know, you were a monster who did horrible things, and this is our way of making you know you can you can atone for your past misdeeds. When in many cases they didn't have any misdeeds to to really atone for. Well, and didn't They're, they also refer to them as penitents as well? Like they weren't yeah, even yes. they weren't recruits, they weren't abductees, they were penitents. Exactly. Yes, uh, and the Templar you meet, Cormac, is has gone through this process. As did Jondar, the person that he himself says you know, Jondar betrays the order when he finds. He turns out that Archbishop Lazarus had stolen some documents when he went to Conduras to become part of the the whole thing with Diablo. And when they sent Jondar to find them, Jondar read them. And in reading them, realized, oh my God, they're doing this to us. That's like when you see Jondar in, in Tristram Cathedral, he hasn't he's turned evil he's he's because he's given up on any faith in the, the light because he believes that what happened to him is you know this proves the light doesn't exist this proves that this is all a sham and that's why he went bad uh the way the, the coven was like you know hey join us you know now that you know the truth why serves you know why serve a, an organization that is you know d- that has done this and he was like you're right so in a way we killed jondar we shouldn't have we should have like you know but that's the other thing uh, the, the order did not recruit women, period. They, they only did this to men because they, they wanted to make it absolutely impossible for them to have children. Like, th- you know, I mean, you, you know full well you can still have romance when it's a bunch of guys. That's, that's not impossible. But they wanted to keep them from having family lives in any way, shape, or form. So that was just – the Templar Order is a real example of how, how badly Mephisto messed up the Zaka room. Because even the ones that weren't his servants, that weren't affected by him directly, that weren't serving him, weren't corrupted by him, they they were so destroyed by what he did that they couldn't come up with anything better than torture random people until they decide they believe what you tell them to. Well, I mean, it makes a certain amount of sense, too, right? Because, well, I'm not saying, I'm not going to try to justify it because it's still torture no, and it's I'm awful. Saying, you're, you're not saying it's good. You're saying, you can understand how they got there. Yeah, and I'm making, I just want to make sure that point's clear. So if you think about it, so what Mephisto did is he spent time corrupting essentially the hierarchy of the church, sending away those that would be uncorruptible, uh, making sure that he he could basically work unfeathered. And then you have these people who are still devoted are not corrupted because he focused on the upper levels. He focused on like the council of the Zaka room um, and those would delineate orders down and, and so on and so forth. And that was more his style, which means that the, the, the lowly members, the ones that were devout or were following the orders and the faith that they had subscribed, had, had ascribed to uh, when word comes down that the order had been corrupted, that everything that you had built your life on was destroyed. And from the inside out, essentially, you start to question your faith. You start to question, I did this because I was told it was right. Was that before or after the whisperings of a greater evil? Uh, And then you start to have an identity crisis of self. And so you view yourself, at least, and I'm putting myself in sort of like their, their position here. You are essentially unsure if you were corrupted or not. And you look at all of humanity and you realize 
we all have these things that can be corrupted. My love and faith for the church, for this faith, for this organization was used against me and essentially made me unclean. So now I'm going to basically break myself until I can't remember any of that. And I'm going to do everybody else the favor of doing that as well, because the world still needs protecting the world. The primevals are still out there. Their minions are still out there. We still have work to do. We can't abandon that. We can't abandon that core part of our faith and identity. But if we do exactly what we did before, it's just going to be corrupted again. But if we don't have these attachments and if the people we take uh, and, and push through this, they don't have those attachments either. They don't have the humanity portion where they form those connections that can be exploited. They become perfect warriors of protecting the rest of the world and they can go out and cleanse and we can go out and cleanse because now we can't be corrupted. And again, it's not right in any way, shape or form, but it's them justifying how they can keep doing their job because that's all they have. It's worth mentioning the way that this ultimately happened, the corruption, that Mephisto spread. He didn't actually get control of the church outright until much later. Like he was seeping forth from the soul stone and corrupting it from the moment it was put underneath Travancal. But he didn't actually get control until almost like well over a hundred years later, maybe more. Um, the, the Quihagen, oh, I think his name's Kalim. Kalim or Kalim. I'm not sure. Kalim. Which. Uh, he was, kind of a problem for Mephisto in that he couldn't be corrupted. Like he just wouldn't go for it. Oh yeah. Mephisto couldn't break him. So he had the ones that he had control over murder him. Not just murder him, murder and dismember him. Yeah. And they replaced him with, uh, I can't, I always can't remember the names. Uh, San kicker, San kicker, San kicker. I think it's San kicker or San kicker. Um, I don't think it's saying kicker, but it sounds like that, but San kicker. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, he became the new Quahagan, and Mephisto literally it possessed him. Mephisto was inside his body. Yes. They blew, they blew the soul stone up into seven pieces that he gave to his most powerful uh, servants on the Zakrum High Council, which he also finally corrupted. And they created a device, a magical orb, that they used to control others. Yeah, the, the, like orb, the orb of compelling. Yeah, so that was... When he finally arranged that, that's around the time, like several years passed, and then they sent Lazarus West with Lyric to do in Kandurus what what uh, Rakim, Rakis had done in Westmarch. But the whole real reason that Lazarus was going west was to wake Diablo up, because when the uh, after the uh, Haradrim had left Mephisto's Soulstone in Karast, they went west and eventually beat Diablo and Baal. Baal, unfortunately, Tal Rasha got his soul stone destroyed. And so Tal Rasha decided, all right, we'll confine him in my body. So that they that's why Baal looks the way he does when you see him. He's possessing Tal Rasha's body. Uh, it took Baal a long time to corrupt him fully, but they, they waged a war inside Tal Rasha's body for, cent- for the, the two centuries. The uh, rest of them, the rest of the Haradrim went further west, eventually found and stopped Diablo. And then they're like, okay, well, we've got a small Haradrim chantry out here. We'll just stick him under that. Nobody goes there. So they did that. That's the place Lazarus was going. Mephisto had finally gained enough control over the, the Zacharum. It Again, it took centuries. It wasn't like an immediate thing. He didn't like, you know, boop, I'm in charge now. It took him a long time. And that's the whole thing that was concerning Akan in the first place. I find myself wondering if Mephisto was was deliberately doing this to Akan to get him to like put together an order and send them out into the world and thus get them out of the way. I don't, doesn't say that in any of the lore, but I do find myself wondering if that's what was going on. Because in a way, it was absolutely the perfect time for Mephisto to have to truly devout young members of the church leave and go forth on a quest to find the source of the corruption leaving the place where the corruption was the source of the corruption was Travancall. It was there was literally a chamber underneath Travancall with a soul stone in it. That's where the source of the corruption was. That's the place they should have been looking and they looked everywhere else. Ingenious. You, know? it, it, you have to wonder if this was not part of his plan. I, I mean seriously, I no, oh, I'm not sure nothing it was. nothing says it in any game source, but 
I got. I mean, someday I wouldn't mind if they did a novel or something talking about Akan, about Akan's life. If if there was at some point that Mephisto tried to possess him, realized he couldn't possess him, and he was like, "Well, he's not important enough to really worry about, but I can use this." And that's where all that's where the Order of the Crusaders was originally founded to get rid of people who would be a problem if they stuck around. But at any rate, that's I think that pretty much covers the the three various the all the various holy warriors of the Church of Zacharum, the Paladins, Crusaders, and the Templars. I think that covers all three. I believe it does indeed. Um, we have some more time left, so I guess the question that I would have to ask is. Now we start looking at things like Diablo Immortal and now Diablo 4 coming up. And the the question is, we'll start with Diablo Immortal. That's the time between Diablo 2 and 3. What do we think, uh, if anything, any of these orders are going to be playing a part of in that moment? Because it, that, Go ahead. So we know that the Crusader is playable in Diablo Immortal. And since we know that the Crusader is playable, and since we know the Crusader takes on the name of their predecessor. And I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be Crusader Joanna there. Cause it looks like in all the art, it looks like the exact same Crusader. Um, is that supposed to be the, the, the mentor of the Nephilim Crusader or is it the, the is it the same Crusader? I don't know the answer to that question. Each Crusader does their own thing. Mm -hmm. So it's as an order, they don't do anything. They don't, they don't come together. There's, there's no army of Crusaders showing up. It's one person, two at the most, because their their apprentice might be with them, oh. I think that their role is going to be that their role is going to be like a solitary figure who's like you know has heard about what's happened. They may have just heard about the the fall of Travancal. They may be trying to make their way back there to like see what happened. Um, that that's not sure. As for paladins, they're reeling. Like the hand of Zakarum, what's left of them is forming the Templars right at this moment. This is when the Templars are formed. So. We may get to see the, the rise of the Grand Maester. The Grand Maester may have, at this time, might be some paladin of the Hand of Zacharum who's decided to turn against his, his former masters and try and save the, the Order, and thus creates the Templars. That, that may be happening during Diablo Immortal. I mean, it is happening during Diablo Immortal, but we might see it in the game. I don't know. As for the paladins, though, I have no idea. Like they, it's really hard to imagine any of the paladins who aren't like members of some other organization, like the Knights of Westmarch. Like I, I don't, I can't really see like any anything for the protectors of the word. The, the protectors of the word have been defunct for like a hundred years anyway. Um, so if there's that one random paladin that happens to be a member, or or have was taught by somebody who was taught by somebody who was a member, that guy's going to stay be, as a paladin. But in terms of the group, I don't think they they got a future. Someone, someone will need to come along and actually reform a new paladin order for that to happen. Now, as far as moving from the opposite direction, because it, it seems like we're going to get some potentially some missing pieces, maybe in Diablo Immortal, which might give some some credences. What does a post Diablo three, a post Malthiel? Uh, world look like for these orders. Now, the Crusaders we know are already, you know, there's not as many as there used to be. There's a lower number of them. Uh, we know that the Paladins, again, they're, they're ones that have existed now are probably becoming the Templars or had become the Templars. Do we think that they are a militant bastion force in this world? Like, Because it, it, it's fascinating to me because right now, in the world of Diablo Four, the aftermath, humanity is just decimated, right? We, I think it was what three quarters of humanity is gone. Was the was what we were told? All right, something like that was said. I don't know how true it is. Right, but a large number of folks in the events of Diablo, uh, uh, throughout the events of Diablo Three, humanity is reeling as well. Do we think that we now start seeing? Templar bastions popping up places because well it's safer than the alternative do they start to become a militant uh, organization again that has a foothold in the world because they can fight back against the creatures and, and weird things that are starting to crawl out of the, the, the loom of, of Sanctuary itself so well, I mean we know I'm going to point this out Chaldeum and, and Kedjistan are gone yes completely gone they're gone as states. There is no Kedjistan is a region, but there is no central authority. There is no government. Uh, I think it is fair to say that in general, like you're not going to find any of the, the the nations of sanctuary as we knew them are probably all dead. 
Like there are places like West March exists, Candorus exists, but there's probably absolutely almost no governmental authority and there's no church. Like the churches, the churches exist. We see them in the game. There are soccer room churches all over the place, but there's no church anymore. There's no centralized. This is a world that has completely lost central authority. If the Templar order still exists, and that's a big if, because Cormac was going to try and reform it, but he might have died. We don't know what happened to him. We don't know what happened to anybody. Like really, if there's a if there's a person you knew in Diablo three, they probably died. So is there is there a Templar order to have bastions? Is a is an open question. If as many of them died as everybody else, there may not be. There may not be any organization to do that. On the other hand, if they enough of them survived and and you know held to their slightly altered purpose then there might in fact have risen again they might be a power in the world they you know even if it's only as they hold certain places and keep them somewhat settleable you know lighting a candle versus cursing the darkness sort of thing they may have decided to do that it's impossible to say but i do think it would be interesting if we see in the future like i i've been arguing from the beginning that the next playable class in Diablo 4 should be the Templar. I would tend to agree, and I think it would make the most amount of sense with the way they're going with the story. Uh, at least, I, I shouldn't even say with the way they're going with the story. The way they're going with the character class reveals so far. Like, I mean, it may not be, they may not do it, but I feel like there should be some form of Holy Warrior. And while I like Crusaders and I like Paladins, I feel like they've been done. I almost feel like it would be it would make sense to do a class that is all three. Like that is you could play any of them. You could see how you want. But I think the Templar makes the most sense in terms of they were central to the events of Diablo three without being playable. Yeah. And, and so it, it it gives you a way to go back to that original paladin aesthetic and still have somebody who's more about wrath and retribution. They could be the best of both worlds. Yeah, and I think it makes the most amount of sense, too, because when you start factoring in the way that Crusaders operate, which we talked about earlier in the episode here, is because they're not actively recruiting, uh, because humanity is now decimated, the likelihood of them picking up an apprentice has now dropped exponentially from even what it was before, and it wasn't really that high to begin with. So, I mean, if you want to think about it, if let's say you had a hundred and and 80 so crusaders left and then 80 of them died in one go so now you only have 100 and now there's like less people you know it's it's a self-compounding problem Mm -hmm. there's less of them there's more stuff to try and fight and stop there's less people to recruit those people are probably terrified not many of them are going to want to go forth and join an organization that they see as connected with angels whether or not that's fair yeah, because I mean, and that's the other thing too. Like, how many of the Crusaders' abilities involve uh, wielding the light and holy wings, or summoning holy avatars and wielding the light in a manner that is very close to how angels were seen to be basically wielding things and murdering people in Westmarch, or wielding things and murdering humanity in general? Do you do the people trust that? And I think that's a really interesting point because. One of the one of the things in storytelling, at least as far as like uh, classic uh, horror tales and, and and folklore, is that it it's not the ghosts, it's not the demons that tend to be the worst problem. You can make wards against them. You can wield holy weapons and light against them. It's humanity that tends to be a bigger problem because if you're a crusader and an entire town turns against you, do you murder that town? Is that part of your creed? Are you allowed to slaughter innocents like that when all they are is afraid because you will alight so close to what destroyed the world? And depending on how many years after Diablo 3 is, uh, after Diablo 3 occurred, when the events of Diablo 4 take place, how much of those stories have morphed and, and modified through oral tradition or even written tradition at this point in the various places where humanity still calls home? We've seen from the various things inside of game, even from Decker Cain's recollections and the book of Tyrael and the book of, of, of Cain and, and all that stuff, that sometimes perception doesn't necessarily meet reality. 
because the person writing that book only has a very specific point of view. And somebody who lived through West March and wrote about it, they're probably going to have a pretty damning point of view as far as angels go. Uh, you don't know how that affects things because think about us as people, right? Us as a culture, how many stories were we told by our parents or grandparents or family or ancestors that colored how we live and make choices every day in a world devastated like that? I can already see things being shifting based off of what stories are passed down. Like, yeah, there could have been like the story of one town where, or one area of the world where they saw the crusader fight against the, the forces of, of the heavens itself, that they know that not everything is uh, dark and twisted and corrupted. And then there's others that may have never seen that fighter. They may have never been part and parcel to it, but they saw their loved ones get burned up in flames. They saw demons and angels come for them and they survived and then told everybody about how awful it was. It, it paints a whole different world. And that's the other thing that I think is going to be really interesting too, is if the Templars become the playable class, which I agree, I think, uh, I think you make a very good point that they seem to be the next, uh, they would make the most logical sense as far as having that Holy warrior that sort of fits all of the, the past, uh, pieces that came before it, uh, especially if the order is reborn, if Cormac never dies, if he doesn't die, if he survives, gets back, takes the Templars, cleans up the order, makes them reborn. Maybe they replace it. Maybe they work to, you know, sort of restore a little bit of that faith, become that militant arm, uh, and become that bastion against the darkness. There's a lot of interesting things that could happen as a result of it. And I actually think that the, uh, paladins and crusaders are at least to me, some of my favorite classes from Diablo in the past where their lore is, is very complicated and rich and touched with all parts of everything that really makes Diablo Diablo, right? Their order is touched by the heavens, touched by the hells, uh, faced with corruption, rooted in humanity. It's a very sanctuary story. Uh, you know, and I think that's absolutely fascinating and I think it's really cool. And I hope that we get another, another continuation of that, or, or at least more of that into the future, whether it's nuggets of, of information inside of Diablo immortal that fill in sort of the gaps that are there or in, or in Diablo four, where we get to see what happened to those orders, what happened to the Zacharum faith uh, in the aftermath of Diablo three, because again, I think it'd be a very fascinating story. Uh, is there anything else you want to add to this wonderful episode of, of information that you gave us, Rossi? To be honest, I'm a little parched right now, and I'd like to stop talking. So. <laughs> well, that's perfectly fair, but thank you very much. And uh, honestly, thank you for filling in a lot of those gaps. Um, I'm learning as much as some of our listeners, uh, because as much as I love Diablo, it's definitely my weakest Blizzard IP uh, as far as lore goes. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, Blizzard Starcraft Watch. one is amazing. <laughs> I actually know more about StarCraft than I do Diablo, surprisingly. I know less about StarCraft and Diablo, so um, <laughs> you're going to be doing that for us. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, but Blizzard Watch is made possible due to the generous contributions at patreon.com slash Blizzard Watch. Your continued support means this podcast, site, and community is able to thrive and grow. Blizzard Watch supporters enjoy exclusive benefits like early access to the podcast, a better chance at having your question answered on our podcast or the queue, and an ads free site experience. Uh, again, folks, if you have questions for us, please send them in. Uh, you can send them to podcast at blizzardwatch.com uh, to specify which show it is for. Uh, you can also send them in through Discord, where we do have a channel set aside for Patreon supporters. Uh, it's Patreon Q and podcast questions. Go ahead and throw them in there. And if you can't support us on Patreon, which we understand times are tough for everybody, uh, we do have a Q questions channel in the Discord as well, which we do look to. Um, we didn't get a whole lot of questions this week. I'm wondering if you guys were just anticipating as much as I was continuing the Diablo talk. But if you want to take a break from that and ask us some other questions, we're well open to it. Uh, be sure to send them in to us. But with that, thank you very much. We'll see you next week.